Welcome, <clears throat> excuse me, to the uh, to Borderlands to the <laughs> DFL before DNF podcast yeah. on Borderlands. Um, you are in the right place. You Good may not you. realize it. Um, I am today your host, Matt Bergstrom, and I am here with someone you might recognize if you're familiar with the podcast, Mr. Josh Rosenthal. Hey, great to be here. Josh is a uh, eight-time 100-mile competitor, a one-time 800-mile, 800-mile, one-time 100-mile <laughs> finisher. Yeah. And uh, you'll have to pardon me where I am. It is it is 830 on a Monday morning. So if I Oof. sound like I'm a little discombobulated. Got a case of the Mondays. A little bit of a case of the Monday. Just a little touch of the Mondays. Uh, Josh, welcome. How are you? Thank I'm good. I'm good. I'm in good shape. Are you? I actually, I think I am. My body oh, okay. is. <laughs> that is. That's question number one. Is just I haven't had any alcohol you, uh, in like seven weeks. So mentally, you're lost. You're not even. You, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know what to do without it. <laughs> seven weeks you've gone without any kind of alcohol. What's your What's your diet like normally? Let's just. You want to start with your guts. Let's start with your guts. That's a good question. My My normal diet. Uh, my wife's a great cook, and she she enjoys cooking, and we eat well. You know, daily, and we mm -hmm. eat pretty darn good ingredients, but sometimes during the day I get, I'll grab breakfast burritos and stuff like that. And that weighs me down quite a bit, like but by and large, um, diet pretty good. I don't necessarily know exactly what to eat going into the race. I just know that I like the way I feel, uh, when I haven't been eating heavy things, I used to just like eat whatever going into the race and think, Oh, it'll be fine. Like remember the last time I tried Zion and we stopped at that pizza restaurant and I thought I'm going to have an arugula salad. That's like the <laughs> the size I of do my remember head. that. And then I had a beer also, and then I got gout. Yeah. Um, but We're yeah, by and large, no gout this well. time. Everybody's thanks, man. <laughs> thanks. Um, let me go back to the beginning. Now that we've covered your digestion, <laughs> which I feel like is really important, should we start with our history? Why am yeah, I that even would, context would be good on your podcast? Um, I'm really curious to hear this story from your perspective. Okay. Josh always introduces me as the only friend he made in college. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, okay. What's true. The truest version of that sentence is the only friend I made in college who is a, who was a fellow student. Cause I, I feel like I made friends with a few professors Mm -hmm. Um, my philosophy professor, um, Jim Fisher became a friend, even though he got fired as a professor. And, um, one of my all time favorites, a guy named lots unpack, Thomas lots unpack there. We'll cover that on another podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that actually would be a great, like serial podcast. Uh, Tom Painter. I love Tom Painter. Uh, but I didn't like to talk much. I didn't like school at all. And so I would show up at school, put my head down and just get it done. And in my last semester, I was, I was going to be done no matter what degree or no degree. And so I had to get an exception. And I think I took 24 hours my final semester. And one of those was, uh, Vergobi's class. I remember now. And that, that class, I, anytime anyone tells Dr. me that they're in the community, David Vergobi. the best the best lecturer Absolutely. the world has ever known. And anytime someone tells Do me they're know, in the communication school, I tell them, make sure they take his class. But I think he's almost done. Make sure you take his class. Do you know, I still have somewhere in my house, I still have uh, from the knee to the ankle of blood and guts. Barbie. Barbie. Nice. Yep. <laughs> I have, when he started throwing body parts out into the crowd, uh, I did, I caught it. I think when I first had it, there was a foot still attached, but, uh, something happened to the foot, but yeah, I, every once in a while I'm going through stuff and my wife will pull this thing out. And she's like, why do you have a piece of a Barbie? And I was like, don't touch you it. You have no idea. <laughs> Stay back. That's solid gold. 
So you were wearing a Martin uh, anyway. Sexton hat one day. Bottom line, you had a Martin Sexton hat on one day, and I thought, okay, I like Martin Sexton. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to open my mouth and say something to that person. And uh, it's like, is it? Do you like Martin Sexton, or is that just a hat you found? That's probably what I said, <laughs> and I was probably sweating <laughs> as I said. I, it. You know what's funny? I think on some days I actually had a Martin Sexton hat and hoodie on. Mm. So I, I knew you were safe. Really, yeah. So I was, uh, I was a safe space. Yeah. But yeah, I remember that. What's funny is, so I remember the day we did introductions in that class, Dr. Vergobi yep. used uh, like a mnemonic method to memorize the names of everybody in his class. Oh my God. And I saw him years later uh, when I was working up at the university uh, at the coffee shop and he called me Woody. Because in the class, that was how he remembered me. I reminded him That's of a right. guy he went to college with named Woody. I so remember he, that. He called me Woody. We, anyway, wow. but I remember your introduction because your brother's wife had just given birth. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And so you were Uncle Josh. Holy crap. That is incredible. And I still, memory. so this I is have 2009. Named, yeah. I have a brother named Josh, but mm -hmm. you're the person I refer to to my kids even as <laughs> uncle josh even to this day <laughs> well you're you but know, I remember I, also you have a you're a tim matt and josh you have like 30 30 brothers i have there's two. Four, 400 of us actually yeah there's 400 yeah. bergstrom children yes we're like a nest of traditional rats. utah family exactly and uh you're you're matt so and you but you have a brother named tim and josh and In my family order, was tim matt and josh tim matt Josh. Yeah. And in that's your family, it's Tim, Matt, Josh. Yeah. Yeah. So we were meant to be. What a great time. But then I remember too, you were uh, a working musician. That's right. And I remember before we spoke, I was on, I would get a Facebook like ad or a suggested thing because you had just released an album. Uh -huh. And it was always like, I would get the ad of you and that really neat sweater. Oh, oh like really God. neat sweater. I look like Owen Chinese Wilson. Face. Yeah. Oh, delightful. But I remember when you when we were first talking, I was like, "Are you the Josh Rosenthal that Facebook keeps telling me I need to buy your album?" Yeah. Yeah. And then you came to a concert I did uh, downtown uh, in I the did. basement. Uh, I did it. It right was the basement of the church. Yep. And uh, it felt like a trap. I felt like I was yeah. being trapped yeah. into joining. A religion, but it actually just turned out there were a lot of just really nice people there. There were some pretty nice people. <laughs> what turned out to be really <laughs> pleasant. <laughs> people and were just genuinely nice. They weren't trying to to get their claws into me. Well, here's what I want to know. How did so we had this friendship, we hung out, and back then only you had kids. I didn't have kids yet. So there was some there was where there was more flexibility <laughs> because you know, once we started sure. having kids, life got a little bit harder to coordinate. How did we transfer from friend friends to ultra ultra buddies? How did that happen? That's a really great question. You know, when I listen to you talk about how long you've been doing this, it's weird to me that I don't think I really even knew you were doing it early on. Yeah. Because be true. my first introduction to ultra running is when my wife's brother, Steve got into it because he read born to run. Uh -huh. um, I wrote about this back when there was the borderlands website. Um, yeah. So if you're one of the people who actually read that article, hi mom, I guess, <laughs> <clears throat> but um, anyway, yeah. So Steve was a runner. Uh, he read born to run and he started to, he used to live by uh, pioneer not Pioneer Park, but by Liberty Park in Salt Lake. He used to live right in Ninth and Ninth. And uh, hmm. he immediately went out barefoot, walked over to the park, and just started running laps around really? um, Liberty Park barefoot. Yeah. Huh. He'd do it every day, go out there and just run barefoot. Wow. Um, and then he found out about, he'd never been a runner. Like he was a physical guy. He was like a backcountry skier and yeah. loved to hide the backpack. Uh, every summer it just disappear. And then uh, anyway, so he really got into running and he found out about like 50 milers. So he's like, I'm going to do a 50 mile race. That was his first race ever. He'd never done a road marathon. He'd never done half marathon, never done anything. Wow. His first race, he showed up um, 
And I want to say it was, so maybe not 50 miles. I think it was 50 K. I think it was speed goat. I think he did speed goat was the I, first race. He this did. is what I was thinking. Yeah. First ever race was speed goat for him. Yeah. But speed goat. And that was at the starting line. Everybody was talking about other races and Steve was like, well, I don't know. I've never, I've never raced, but I've run a lot. So, um, and he finished, I mean, he was a middle of the pack guy the whole time you run. Anyway, at his for at Speed Goat, he found out that there were hundred milers, and he was like, "Oh, I'm going to do that." If there's hundred milers, I'm going to do that. And I think, uh, I don't know what his first hundred miler was, so I, yeah. I won't speculate. I think it was, it might have been Wasat. I might be. Well, wrong. I don't want to get the know. anyway cart before the horse, but you know, important to note that we wouldn't have a Moab 240 route that we have today because of Stephen. Yeah, because event because he found out about two hundreds. Yeah. When he was at a hundred, he was like, Oh, there's two hundreds. If people can run 200 miles, I'm one of those people. Yeah. That was his attitude was like, if anybody can do this, then I can do this. Yeah. So he ran, I think he might've missed the first year of Tahoe. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, every year he did Tahoe and Bigfoot yeah. um, until he passed away in 2016. And then, he had always been in touch with Candace. I think uh, you talked about this on Candace's episode. I did, where they yeah. had been. He used to love to give feedback. Um, Ultra, actually, early on, Steve was very vocal, very much in contact with the people at Ultra um, hmm. because they were up in Park. He, he, at that time, he lived um, in a cabin just uh, outside of Park City, kind of out in the woods. Yeah. Kind of out in the woods. It's like five miles off of I-80 uh, oh, outside wow. of Wand Chip. So Ooh, yeah, that's amazing. anyway, it was a pretty unreal where he lived and he built the whole place by hand because again, if someone can do it, he could. So wow. he had help pouring the foundation. Um, and that was it. I helped him do insulation <laughs> once because it was just, uh, we were there visiting and he needed help. So, but that's wow. like the only, he did electrical plumbing, all the framing, everything he did by hand. So anyway, um, but yeah, he was talking with the people at Ultra and they were uh appreciated his feedback. Not everybody does. I mean, I know after after he finished his first 200, oh, now I forget who it is. I'm totally blanking on who won it. It was the person who won Tahoe after Steve finished the race like middle of the pack. Steve mm -hmm. finished and the first thing he did is he went up to the guy who won and started to tell him what he did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> tell the guy who won what he had done wrong. Steve was like, Oh, what, what the winner had done wrong. Yes. Not what Steve had done wrong. You know, also it's funny. Uh, you talk about worrying about injury. Yeah. Um, Steve sprained his ankle 60 miles into Tahoe one year. And one still six, the race. 16. No, six, zero, six, zero, so still 140. So just, over, just over a fourth of the way into the race. He did the last three quarters of that race on a sprained ankle. Yeah, that's cool. So, yeah. but anyway, yeah. So he had also been, he'd been talking to Candace Burt a lot about doing a race in Moab. And he had actually, he had this idea for like this adventure race that would involve like canyoneering hmm. and mountaineering, like ropes and river crossings and all this stuff. Yeah. Um, which I think was. I mean, it would be hard. Well, it wouldn't be hard to draw people in. There's a lot of people out there who do that sort of thing. But I think Candace knows the kind of race that she runs, and she also saw that potential down there. So yeah, after he passed away, mm -hmm. um, they went down, and uh, I was actually lucky enough to get to go down during the course plotting um, oh, really? for about a week. Yeah, and I I kind of just did. I ran. Uh, I was transportation, mm -hmm. carrying a lot of runners on my back. <clears throat> That's not true. That carried them in my Subaru. But uh, yeah, it was uh, Candace and a group of people, a group of runners. Um, spent about a week down there just driving around while they, some of them ran sections of the course, some people mountain bike sections of the course. Mm -hmm. um, I pointed from afar to sections of the course. Oh, that looks nice. That looks good. That's about the extent of mine. Well, I remember, really okay. Cool to get to be so when Steven passed away jeremy texted me and said did you know that matt and kathy's brother just passed away and i said you know i know the name sounds familiar but i'm not really into the ultra running community yet uh, so i didn't quite know the name and then jeremy explained like oh you know here's his 
CV, ultra running CV. And, uh, it's like, oh, right. damn. And so by, and by that point I had been out on, yeah, running trails in various capacities, you know, maybe I'd done a 50 miler by then. At least I had done my first mm-hmm. like 50 K. And so then I guess we just started to connect on that level of like, you know, Hey, I'm trying to do the hundred miler. And you're like, Hey, I've been around those things. They're easy. Yeah. It, I remember having that conversation with you and Jeremy. Yeah. yeah. I was like, anybody can do it. My brother-in-law just picked up and just did it. He just ran. Well, away. it's, it's ran Steven's away. statement that haunts me of the, uh, that 200 milers are the new 100 milers <laughs> where I was like, that's not true. <laughs> 200 miles. It, are- I will tell you, I'll tell you this. So my very first hands-on experience with an ultra was working an aid station. It was the last aid station at Tahoe. So it was uh-huh. mile 190 of a 200. And this is my first long-term exposure to ultra runners. So I'm yeah. seeing people yeah. on the edge and this is like, Oh, welcome to the show. Everyone here is dying constantly. <laughs> and I remember a lot of people talking to me and the best thing, there was this guy who showed up, um, he spent like eight hours at the aid station. He took like a, he got a like full night's sleep in and, um, I got to help him with some, uh, a pretty delicate digestive matter he was dealing with at the time mm-hmm. by way of being exposed to a lot at my first <clears throat> ultra. Anyway, he was telling me, he's like, look, if you're fit enough to run a marathon, which is what he used to, he got into ultras total sidebar. He got into ultras because he was looking for a better way to train for marathons. He was like a, an actual okay. competitive marathoner. He would oh, I see. races. And- okay. <clears throat> so he did his first 50 K trying to train for a marathon. And that was his first trail run. And after his first trail race, he's like, I'm never running on the road again. But mm-hmm. what he said was, if you're fit enough to run a marathon, everything else is just a matter of, uh, it's your mental state and planning. He's like, as long as you can plan properly hmm. yeah, and you can keep your head in it, you can do any, you can do any distance given enough time. So don't, sh- don't shy away from the 200. Candace told you it's a, it's a yeah. completely different ball game. Well, actually, yeah. The way that she sold it to me, she kind of did sell it to me, <laughs> you know, that Good. Uh, just be, regardless of your hundred your acumen at the hundred miler uh, that has nothing to do with how you'll do at a 200 plus miler, which I thought, Hmm, I like that. <laughs> I'm yep. probably going to try. I think, I think it has a lot more to do with proper planning. Yeah. Um, because nutrition on that is, I think it's a little e- easier, especially um, the races that Candace puts on the aid stations are like, I mean, you get just about anything you want at one of these yeah. stations. So yeah, she's great. You have dedicated volunteers like Mr. Jeremy Cox, who runs a mm-hmm. tight ship when he does the uh, the aid stations there. Yeah, for anybody listening who's ever done or gone to Moab to yeah. do the 240, when you go into Wind Whistle Aid Station, I think every year except last year, you have enjoyed the hospitality of Jeremy Cox of JD. So, JD Cox. JD Cox. So yeah, then so anyway, I decided to do was, Zion and you said you were going to yes. help me. <laughs> yeah. 2017. You were there. Yeah. 2017. I remember that first year. Um, because honestly, as far as crewing for a runner, I had no idea. I had no clue whatsoever, but you had planned methodically. Yeah. I don't know, you, re- you remember your spreadsheet? Oh yeah. That had like, Yep. Estimated times. Yep. Mile times and yep. when we would be and where. And yep. I always love the Mike Tyson quote that everybody has a game plan until you get punched in the face. Yeah. And I had no idea what it meant to get punched in the face in a hundred miler. I didn't know what that, I, I mean, if it, until you get punched in the face in a hundred miler, you have no, like, you don't even, you don't even know that those feelings are possible. So then that's why my planning has and become that, way less like, eh, let's just go. <laughs> Just go Let's and see do what it. Happens. I think this is a great. I think this is a wonderful idea. What uh, what races had you done up to that point? Um, before you did your first, I'd done a handful. Yeah, I had done a lot of North Face Endurance Challenge 
races in Park City. So I'd done them. I'd done four of those, a marathon, two 50 Ks and a 50 miler. The 50 miler I didn't finish because I got, it effectively got snowed out. And for the mm. people who wanted to keep trudging through the snow, they allowed them to, but they rerouted it from a 50 mile loop to four half marathon loops in the snow. And I, I didn't need that. Oh, so I didn't do that, but I, so that, what else had I done? I don't think I had done speed goat yet. I think I did speed goat after 2017. Um, but most of my experience at that point was, was in the park city, mid mountain, uh, races of okay. North face. So what, where they never, they never offered that? to sponsor me. I thought they would offer to sponsor me North it's face. Weird. I just assumed it, that's why you had to silence your phone is because you're just constantly getting offers for sponsorships. Especially from um, North Face. Yeah, they, they they remember my 2015 half marathon, bottom 25% performance. <laughs> Who could forget? Who could forget <laughs> those halcyon days? Um, so what I want to know what you were, like where was your head at that morning when we mm. went to the starting line that first time? Oh. It was... That year it was it was clear, but it was windy. I remember that. Mm -hmm. it yeah, was Jeremy looked at me. Time. So Jeremy had already run Wasatch, and he looked at me and laughed and said, "Get ready to suffer." I so clearly remembered. He said, "Get ready to suffer," and I and I, I didn't think I'll be fine, but I didn't understand what he meant. But I so clearly remember the you know Zion has started some you know has has so many different starting lines over the years, um, but I just remember right. clearly where we were standing. We start going. I, I just I mean everything that day was I, the probably still to this day the best I've ever felt for fifty sixty seventy miles. Really, it was it was so yeah it was so good. I mean the, my problem. So first off, there's a point now. Now you come down this way. I think where we going up either way, Jeremy and I were on a rope because there's a part where you have to climb a rope with Zion coming right. down to like the BMX aid station, but we might've been going up either way. I had two handhelds and then another one in my uh, pack. And I hand Jeremy one of my handhelds. I was like, here, hold this while I go on the rope. And then Jeremy dropped it off the side of the mountain. So then that I had gone from carrying 1.5 liters of water to carrying one liter of water, but I made it work. I was actually, I was much faster than, so I, I, one liter of water was able to get me aid station to aid station. Right. I mean, still having an all time great day. I had friends fly from all over the country to be aid station, you know, friends I hadn't seen in forever. One came from Florida. One came from Texas, right. one from Salt Lake to another from Texas. Is that true? Anywho. Then lots of people from Salt Lake driving down together. And uh, so Lee, who's like 65, 66 at the time, he's, he's just a beast of a human. Right. He picked me up at uh, mile 60, and we were running from mile 60 to mile 78 together, or maybe 62 to 78. And he mm -hmm. didn't carry any water with him, didn't have a pack of any kind, didn't bring any nutrition of any kind. And so now I had my two water bottles which was one liter total. And we go right. into the aid station where we're about to go off the face of the big cliff, basically to go down at yep. mile 60 something. And I leave a water, I leave my water at the aid station. And I, so then I have one handheld. And so then we're kind of destined to, after we come down, it's 1500 feet over like an eighth of a mile. So you're just going straight right. down. We get to the bottom. I realize I left my water and I'm, we're not going back up that. And so we have eight or nine miles to go in the middle of the night with no water and Lee, I remember him saying, he said, I, he said, I wish I would have thought he, he had no exposure to ultras. He said, I wish I would have thought to bring water, but it was only going to be a 16 to 18 mile run. So if I would have remembered to bring water or if I would have thought to bring water, you could have had my water because I don't drink water unless I'm running longer than this. <laughs> so, right. uh, so I'm just wildly dehydrated not thinking very well coming to mile 76 or 78 or whatever it was 78 78 quads were just like i mean it, my quads were blown because i think because they were thirsty that is the only way i could think of it right. because my fitness was so good and then I, I come into that aid station and um as the precedent was set that 
when my mind goes dark to a dark place, external factors can't help me get out of it. Right. Um, so effort one, 78 miles and, uh, you know, didn't make it, didn't make it out. You know, I was thinking about that race just the other day. Um, because I know you've kind of recapped a lot where you've thought back on a lot of those races and you're like, well, yeah. maybe I could have gone on at some point. Maybe I couldn't. I am remembering taking you back to the Airbnb that mm-hmm. night after mm-hmm. we dropped Kyle back off at his camper, we yeah. got back to that Airbnb. And I remember you had to be carried mm-hmm. Like yeah. you had had a lot of rest time. You'd been sitting in the back of my car for almost an hour at that point. Yeah. And I remember David Figgy came out and oh, the two of us memory. together had to like carry you to the couch in there. Like you were, uh, and it was, it was that water issue. I remember because you were doing, <laughs> we were sitting there. Um, it was me and Kyle and uh, somebody was there. I think to pace Jeremy was also waiting. Freeberg maybe. For a big part of that. Yes, it was Freeberg. Um, but we were sitting there and I kept looking at my watch and I was like, it can't be right. Like where he said they are, it can't be right. Cause you were doing 30 minute miles. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what does that mean? Like what speed are mm. you going? So anybody mm-hmm. listening, I challenge you to try <laughs> out, go outside and try to walk, like literally make the attempt at walking so slow. Yeah. You're doing 30 minute yeah. miles. And that was, I knew you were, in trouble at that point. Um, before you actually came in, I wasn't sure if it was like, you know, sit down, get a rest, get some food and you shake it off. And maybe you can keep going yeah. trouble. Um, and looking back on it, I don't know if you ever think that on that race, if you're like, Oh, maybe I could have, but uh, not, not that well, day. I, I really blame. Race later later. Yeah. I, I mean, really I blame Jeremy. It's a hundred percent. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's this element that, you know, I, I would give anything to go through my first one again, because, um, now that I know what suffering to expect, it does make me more excited to go do it, but not knowing, not having any idea. I mean, I think pacing, why I, I looked at it the other day, like I was just curious, how was my pacing for that? You know, I, I probably, I, I could have had like a 26 hour finish, which would have been a real great finish for me. Um, right. but I, I, I don't look back at that with regret. I do look back at it with longing though. Like, ugh, like I just, I wish I had done yeah. it. I wish I had finished it. I'd, I would love to have finished my first one just to set, to set things off differently than I set them off into my, my hundred, hundred mile career. <laughs> right. Let's call it that. Did you, uh, so did you do any other races between that and Zion the next year? Oh Yeah. I was so pissed. Okay. Pissed. I mean, pissed. Not. I was so. The fire was lit. Six weeks later, right. I tried for Bryce, the Bryce Hunter Miler. Six weeks later, by myself. That's right. I was like, well, I'm not gonna. So lat. So effort one, Texas, Florida, all over. You know, Utah, people, people, and I thought, oh man, I just let everybody down. Like all these people flew all over. I I'm gonna go do the next one, and I'm not gonna. No, no pacers. No nothing. We went down with the family. We camped. Um, some friends did come and camp, but there was no like pressure of any kind. They right. were doing their thing. I was doing mine. And uh, got to mile fifty, and um, I, I ran with a guy who I, who I recall saying was buddies with Hal Kerner, who you know, ultra running legend that I love. I'm a huge fan of. I ran with him for a long mm-hmm. time. And it, the one thing that I see as a theme because this happened with alex once too at buffalo is that some people talk about um like some people will flippantly talk about dnfing in the middle of the race and then they don't and me like when i'm if i'm talking about it it's i'm not i'm not kidding so this guy was like coming into mile 50 i didn't have anyone meeting me at mile 50 i can't i was coming into 50 I mean, I, I just had blisters like I had never experienced because running through Bryce, there's so much sand that gets in your feet and rubs you just totally raw and blisters everywhere. I'd never experienced and anything was this like the, that. Was this the year it was like record heat down there too? <clears throat> I know it, a lot oh, of people who ran it. 
said there were sections of that where the reflected heat off the rocks literally felt like you were running through a furnace just like insane that's right. heat that year it was absurdly heat i remember seeing a guy danny witterberg who's kind of a utah uh, icon of of ultra running i, I just remember seeing him like everyone right. was just kind of middle of the day hiding in the tent like trying to get shade and right. um yeah so that that's a good memory my and, and also there's a Stephen, there's a Stephen Jones aid station at Bryce, right? There's I I, I recall year. going into like some of the, re, the the coolest of the cool like red Mars like running before you enter into that. There's a big poster of Stephen Jones, uh, and it's like the Jones family <laughs> and Jones family and so friends that running would, that, that aid station. Been, so my brother-in-law, um, who many. Uh, ultra runners know as Barkley, Barkley, really? Chubby Checker, really? Jones, I Brian. He's my brother in law, Brian. A lot of people know him as Barkley. He's run uh, quite a few. He actually just did mm. um, Buffalo uh, last oh, week. Cool. So cool. he, yeah, he went and did that. Um, but anyway, he, I, he manned the aid station there. And whenever he would do the aid station, he would take the big poster. That was actually from the first year. Uh, the last aid station at Tahoe, they called the Stephen Jones aid station that they made that poster. But yeah, whenever hmm. the Jones family is running an aid station, they've always got the, the big, yeah, there. that's, uh, that's a, that's but a, so what, that's, what mile was that? Who? Because, uh, Bryce is an out and back, right? The routes changed over the years. That one, oh, okay. that route compared to now is very different. Now it starts in hatch, Utah. It used to start, I can't think of the town. I was just there, but it's like, it's right by the entry to Bryce and oh, okay. you get, you get, you'd get bust over to the starting line and then you'd go and you actually weren't far from Stephen Jones when that year. So I, I ran, I ran Bryce 50 miler and the hundred miler a handful of times, but I, I, I just recall in that race getting to mile 50, it was an out and back. Yes. That year it kind of was because I got to mile 50 mm -hmm. and I was as far away from the starting line as one could be a very unwise place to DNF, um, <laughs> to get extracted. You walk back. <laughs> yeah. Why not? So I, I think I quit that day and I don't attribute that to, I mean, when I think to that, it, it's not because I didn't have a crew in my mind. It was more so like the blisters that are possible. I just, I had no idea. Also, I had no idea how to keep, I had no idea how to keep going with them. I hadn't done the deep dive of research into, you know, moving forward with blistered feet, blister prevention of any kind. And <clears throat> so at mile 50, I quit. And thankfully there was a person there, uh, a couple that was there that drove me back to my campsite uh, 50 miles away, which is super nice of them. But then, then I went back to, then I got back on the saddle and did Zion right. the next year. Got my finish. And that was, so that was 2018 is the year you got the finish. Yep. Is that right? Yeah. Um, have you talked at all to your brother, Matt, about coming out for the race this year? Because he was, that was the only year he was there. I know. We have, we, we have, he and I have texted, texted a little bit about that, you know, for, uh, cause like, is that the variable? Cause Cordell, he got me through the night. I needed a physician to get me through the night. So that was awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, Colby was there. Incredible en encourager. But Colby mm -hmm. had been in other races. But yeah, you had been in other races. My brother. <laughs> That's the only one he's ever been to. Yeah. And I finished. And he came that. out and he ran with you about eight miles. It was the yep. one loop out and back. Yeah. On the plateau. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was that? I always forget. I, that's the one plateau. I always forget what it's called, but, um, Grafton. Grafton. And, uh, Grafton yeah, that was that he ran with me through Grafton and that was, uh, yeah, maybe, I mean, he's the, maybe he's the X factor. Maybe. And that was right as the sun was setting, I think too. So you were going into the night. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. Cause him. I remember what, carrying headlamps. What do you and, think? Yep. Looking back on that race, what, felt different like what is the thing about that race that you felt or didn't feel because at that time you'd only dnf'd 
twice. Zion once. Yeah. And yeah, Bryce yeah. once. Yeah. <laughs> but right. I'm just saying you're you're on the exact same course. I even think that second year it was still the same. No, it wasn't the same starting line. It was at the park the second year you did it. It moved across oh. the highway to the park. That's right. Is where the start was that second year. That year, let's see. Jeremy didn't run it. I'm trying to remember if I knew anybody at the starting line. I oh, it rained. It was raining all morning. Really? And it it tired me out a little bit, but I loved it. Just I remember the first year it was so dry and dusty. Um, everybody was getting dust in their shoes. And so you were getting a lot of oh, blisters, right. a lot of really nasty blisters. And that next year, yeah, dust wasn't so much an issue. No. It was just <laughs> muck. But you prefer the muck. I, I liked the muck. I'm uh okay. It's starting to come back to me. The previous three months before this race, we lived in Europe. So January, February, March of that year, we did France for a month, mm -hmm. Croatia for a month, and Italy for a month. And I ran a ton. Okay. Then it's coming back to me. The reason it's coming back to me is because I had a okay. soundtrack that year that I was running a ton. I, it was uh, Bleachers. I loved I loved uh, Bleachers. the album that he had that. put out that year. So I remember coming in at mile 25 or 26 – into I think that was coming into the BMX aid station because that was the old route. You go up, you go up Smith, and then you, <clears throat> then you come down Flying Monkey, iconic like uh, mm -hmm. mountain bike uh, downhill thing into the aid station at mile. At my, you know, I was just remember thinking my first marathon. Like I felt so good, I was just so happy. It was like a moment of like all of the good chemicals firing, and I was just you know floating. And I was texting with everybody coming in. So one of the things that was different about that, there was a crew element that was important, but I don't know if you remember how many people would be at the aid station, like for me, like I remember mile 90, like the last one after Cordell had dragged my ass through the night, there were like uh -huh. 14 people at that aid station that were in my, you know, on my team. I do remember that. Right. And, uh, feeling great. Cause Alex was there. And we had just started to become friends. So the, the horns were there. The Timbos were there. The Carpers were there. My brother and his wife, my wife and kids. It was just like, I felt great. And I saw Hayden Hawks, who I'm, you know, as a fan, he was there supporting his wife at a, at a shorter <laughs> distance. But I was like, oh my God, do I look tough? Like here's elite runner Hayden Hawks, who was still like on this, the ascent in his career, but he had just won red hot, I think the year before. Oh, Red Hot's one I had ran several times prior. Anyway, I'm sitting there thinking, right. mile 90, do I look tough? Because there's Hayden Hawks. And, you know, I didn't because there was a, you know, Cordell was like giving my knee a massage and, uh, you know, wasn't looking as tough as I had hoped. But I just remember so many people being there. And I think that's an element. This time there's a lot of, I've got a lot of people that'll be there. So regardless of if they're with me pacing, in the race, right. just having a lot of people at the aid station. I don't know if you listened to Alex's podcast, but that was a really, really good one to think about like the oxytocin boost that comes with seeing people that you're looking forward to seeing. Right. And to me, I think when I look back at those aid stations and knew that that many people were out there rooting for me, I don't know if that was the difference maker, but I sure do remember it feeling good at that year. Yeah. Well, that's good. Looking at it from a positive perspective, because the year before yeah. that, when you didn't finish, uh, you say you, you felt like you really let a lot of people down. Yeah. <clears throat> Which you yeah, that don't ever, I don't feel that way. I've been there for five of your eight. Yeah. Right. All four yeah. Zion. Yeah. You, you haven't been there for the two far. Wasatch. I've never been to Wasatch because Wasatch is always the same weekend as Tahoe. And I have been at Tahoe both times you've run Wasatch. Ah, uh, okay. What's the other one you haven't been so, to? Did you miss a Buffalo? No, you were at Buffalo. Bryce. I wasn't there for Bryce. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Yep. Got it. I wasn't there so for Bryce or either Wasatch. Oh, Got the it. last time you did Wasatch, I was um, in Park City and uh, I was there for something else. So I was like right in the middle of Wasatch, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> but wasn't there to, to yeah. check in on the race. Anyway. Yeah. So that's a good thing. You've got a lot of people there. Um, Something that I'm really curious about, you keep talking about on the podcast that yeah. uh, I want to get your feelings about this before I tell you my feelings about it. 
um, yeah. Pacers this time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What are, you, what are you thinking today? I know it probably changes from minute to minute, but what are you thinking yeah. right now? Okay. I've thought about this a lot, obviously. So at the starting line is going to be three people that I love dearly that are going to be running it with me. Jeremy Cox. I mean, I like him kind of. He's all right. Uh, Alex Horn and uh, Ryan Mansell. So Who Ryan was my best to meet. Oh, you'll love him. And Good he, gosh. In the same him. town. Yeah. I know. We grew up, we grew up, went to high school together. He went on to be a Green Beret Special Forces, um, lives in Seattle area near you. And mm -hmm. um, this will be his first 100 miler. But I, I love what, I mean, we've talked a lot. He offers me a bunch of advice like that he came through. I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I did, every time he offers advice, I assume he came to it by way of, you know, Green Beret Special Forces stuff. Sure. But Alex is Air Force C-17 pilot, evolutionary biologist guy. And then Jeremy, by his own definition, data nerd, but just like a, you know, we've highlighted him a lot. He just keeps going. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited to go with them and go out with them and be with them for as long as possible. Year one, one of the things Jeremy and I both look back on is we look back on very fondly that we ran the first 50 miles together. But then when our, it was time to pick up pacers, Evan Lewandowski picked him up at mile 50 and my friend Dusty picked me up at mile 50. And then we went our own separate ways <clears throat> with our pacers, but we really always thought, Oh, we could have just stayed together or keep, at least keep yo-yoing because we were just doing so well together. Right. Um, Shout out by the way to Evan Lewandowski at that race for providing me with one of the best hamburgers I have ever okay. had. I was not. Doesn't prepared. surprise me. I was not very well prepared that first year to take care of myself as a mm. crew chief. Mm, interesting. <clears throat> anyway, I came upon Evan uh, and his friend as they were off the trail making burgers before they're getting ready to go. And anyway, amazing. So I just want to give, yeah, shout out Evan, that. Evan Lewandowski, the great, the great winemaker uh, yeah. who, whose whole identity was built around being a, well, I don't know what he built his identity around. I, everyone knew him as the Utah winemaker. Uh, right. He can be whoever the hell he wants, but he, he's moved on to Mendocino, but you know, one of the, one of the early natural winemakers and one of the best and a hell of a runner. So he yeah. took Jeremy. And they, I find his, I find his wine occasionally here in, uh, in Washington oh, yeah. and no uh, surprise. his labels are still shaped like the state of Utah. So whenever I see I know. him, I look at people, people who have no idea who I am and I give them like the, <laughs> and they're like, why are you talking to me? And I'm like, I'm really sorry, ma'am. Anyway. So yeah. So you uh, ran okay, with so, Jeremy. It felt good. Yeah. So I love that. So this year we're going to do that. Uh, we're, we're probably going to do a podcast where me, cause I think it's an interesting thing to think like, there's a lot of pressure with four people starting together too, of like, Hey, is there a point like where are we, we need to be able to give each other permission to do to yo-yo to go forward. If you're not feeling good, should you, do you want me to stay with you? Do you want to go all that sort of stuff? But ultimately what we uh, plan to do, well, ultimately what I'm, you know, I'm thinking is that stay with these guys as long as possible, whatever that mm -hmm. looks like, whether I go for, go on and they go on or whatever. But right. one of my, one of my, one of my lasting phobias that I can control, I've got two major phobias left. One is uh, the dark of night. And uh, the other one is my kids dying. Both are irrational to a degree. But when I think about, the dark of night, it's the same way with my fear of snakes that I had to, I had to be near them, you know, to get over it, to get to the other side to where I no longer have that phobia of snakes. I think I have a healthy fear of snakes and a fascination with them. And so now I want to do that with the dark of night. So a piece of this is, is honestly, is my, is my headlamp strategy. How am I going to light the trail in front of me? And as much okay. as I don't like all of the hullabaloo, if you will, of the Kogala uh -huh. light. Uh, -huh. uh, it's, it's a lot to carry, but that thing is super In bright. Invented fun fact by my eldest brother's wife's uncle. Oh my goodness. Is his name yeah, Kogala? <laughs> no, his last name is Robin. But <laughs> uh, yeah, he, uh, okay. I didn't know that. Well, it's he, a, it's a phenomenal resource. It's just a lot. It's a big to do. Sure. Uh, battery packs and, but, but you see uh, those, you see those coming when you're yeah. seeing, especially at Zion, there's that aid station that's out in the middle of the plane. 
and you watch uh, people coming down the mountain, you watch them coming across the plain, and you know, you know, if it's miles, a miles away when someone's yeah. got a Kogala because it looks yeah. like a car coming. Yeah. So, so I, I need that, like, because it lights up the trail really well. And then I'm also, for directional purposes, if I want to look off to my right or to my left, I'm going to have a, a headlamp on. And it's just so okay. it's pathetic. I mean, I'm just going to be like a, yeah, I'm a freight train coming. And I'm, so, so I'm using a, a nog. Let's stay, away, let's stay away from the self-defeating talk. That's true. Here comes a well-lit, beautiful man. Exactly. Like an angel <laughs> descending. Here comes the, an angel uh, descending and ascending from aid stations. And I, uh, so I feel like that's, that's a thing. And also, you know, tagging along with people as necessary, but to do stretches in, in the desert is, uh, important to me. If I think about where I'll be at that point, it's a place where there is a bit of a log jam. It's when you go up it's coming out of BMX, maybe the light, it'll still be lit, but then you go up to another Mesa and, right. uh, you do a, you do a loop up there. So I'll be doing that. And then I'll be coming down in the night and then I'll be crossing the virgin desert in the night before doing the big uphill. And all of those places are places that I feel familiar with. Um, that if I do get to a, a stretch where I'm not with somebody, I feel confident. Now mm -hmm. a thing that was critical the year that I finished was Cordell helping with my knee pain that right. only came up at high mileage. I think I, at this point with the amount of strengthening I've done around my knees over the, since then I've never felt anything even close to that pain. Um, not, not even in the ballpark of it. So I'm hoping that that doesn't, but there could be something else that pops up. So as it stands currently, my, my plan and hope is that either Jeremy or Alex or Ryan will, that will all still be together at that point. Um, but if not, that's, that's where my head's at. And then the sun okay. rises. I once I get to the top, maybe around mile 80, that's a, that's a possibility mm -hmm. when the sun's rising. Okay. So you're, you're willing to take pacers after the dark, but you want to face this fear of the dark. Do you yeah. feel like that's, this is the okay. right time to face that fear of the dark? That's a, that's a good question. If I don't know, adding, I don't know. You're adding that on top of where your mind and body are going to be at that point. Cause the sun goes down. Um, you're pretty close to halfway through at that point i hope yeah i don't i can't remember what bmx is where that because last time when i ran it and you met me there I changing the course i know we were we were together uh, you know we hung out that aid station for a bit before i went off on my way and mm -hmm. the gout hit me and the sun was still up when i came in obviously then it was the long trudge up that hill right uh, where i lost it is it the right time? I mean, my, my worry, my, I don't know, worry is the right word. I don't know if I'm going to do another hundred miler. I just, I, I don't know. So it, it, it's more like a, Hey, this is something that's always been important to me. So if not now, then when, what, so I thought this the last time too, a little bit, uh, the gout, the gout 100. <laughs> and I, I ended up, you know, going in the night I was with this guy who he played linebacker for the Baltimore Ravens. And he was, I remember there. that because I was, Hanging out at the aid station oh, with his wife. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I sat and talked to his family yeah. at the aid station. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, and so he, uh, I remember that, that we walked, we were together that whole time. That, so th that's, uh, that's one of the things also that I feel confident in. To, to me, if I tag along with someone I don't know, that to me feels as much mm -hmm. as a success as I, I don't want to be isolated in that overnight, but I also want to, um, navigate it to some degree on my own okay that doesn't mean alone right so right now, but right now you have no pacers lined up other than Correct. the possibility of running with. yeah i mean becky uh, my wife may run uh last aid station in nice um or among the last two that's that's what mm -hmm. we're looking at right now we've got um at the house that we have there's I think 2000 children staying with us at this house and three yeah, adults at last count, you were last right. count is 2000 kids, yeah. but we have, yeah. we have, we're, all, we're bringing a babysitter. So that way parents, cause Alex is one of those parents and right. then Ben videographer is the other parent. So we've all kind of going to be out there. So we got babysitters coming. So that would free Becky up yeah. to, to be able to run with me. So that's, that, that's, that's, that's what we're looking at right now. Yeah. 
Is it the right time? Right. The, that's a great question. The right time. It's the only reason it feels like the right time. It's because I don't know if I'm going to do this again. And I really want to do this. You really want to do it. Do you do any nighttime training? Like as the run I comes d- up, are you doing runs overnight? No, I mean, not, yourself? not lately. Here's the deal. My, my thinking on that is like from a strengths, like strengths based thing, like the overnight to me is, is a bit of a weakness. So if I'm gonna like doing a few overnights, so Jeremy's like, Hey, I'm gonna do an overnight. I'm gonna do an overnight. You should come do an overnight with me. To me that I just don't, it's not going to move the needle much. If anything, it'll make okay. me pop. It perhaps could make me dread it. It's just like, Oh, I just did this. Okay. I don't know right. if I want to do this again. I love the, obviously the only reason I love the overnight is because I love the sunrise. So I've, you know, I've done the overnight a good six or seven times and I don't necessarily like them anymore. However, just being out and getting good volume in my running, which has been, this is the best volume I've ever gotten has been right. good and some strength training. So if, it, if the overnight's going to be hard, no matter what, I just, I couldn't move the needle by doing more. That's been my thinking as I've been working with scarce available time. Right. Do you, I think you and I talked about this once before, but do you have goals for this race beyond just finishing? I mean, I, I, I always think that this could be the race where I finally get the W you know, right. <laughs> like, Hey, you know, I, I finished, I, I finished one Yeah. at 28 hours and eight minutes. Could I get a 17 hour this time and win it all? Why not? Why not? If I didn't believe that in, in my brain, <laughs> no, sure. I, I mean, there, I have this awful competitor thing. I mean, like, yeah, I know I can finish. I don't have the evidence, you know, that much evidence. I know I can finish. And I also know that on a, on the right day I could finish in a good time. That that said, this is the first time. I mean, every, every time I'm like, oh, my goal is just to finish before the cutoff at the very end. And most of the time when I dig deep down into my heart and soul, I don't mean that. Right. I'm not at Wasatch. I'm not willing. Like when I, when I DNF my last Wasatch, when the, like the flash flood thing hit going into Lambs Canyon, right? it was, uh, I was on a, I was I was on pace to make it to Upper Big Water with the sun still up, and I uh, and when that storm hit and it just derailed all of these times that were happening in my mind. It was like there's a part of it that was like yeah, I couldn't recover from it because I was exceeding my goal for the day, and now to go to go to like Plan C because I couldn't muster the strength to just keep running in the flood, and I hid, and right. I sat down for too long. And then I, for some reason, walked two miles back to the other aid station to hopefully get a change of clothes or something. I mean, just poor decision after poor decision. Yeah. Uh, so I know I have a great performance in me that's beyond just sure. the finish. So I have to explore that. But this time, because I don't know if I'm going to go for number 10, maybe I will, maybe I won't, but I, I'm not convinced. In the past, I've always been convinced. I'll just do another one. Mm-hmm. This one, I truly am going into it, meaning with DFL before DNF. Like I will absolutely, I have to, even if the finish line's been torn down, like it's done, I'm going to finish. This one is going to, I'm going to cross. If the finish line's been torn down, I'm going to cross where they did have it. Like this one is that to me. Right. Same Good. time, may, maybe I'm going to win it. <laughs> yeah. Why not? You know, exactly. it's probably, it's probably a lot easier to just finish quick then you're not running like all day right 17 that, I mean, hours of running is a lot more appealing than 24 hours of running or 26 or whatever so but to be honest like when um so my friend lee who i mentioned earlier who was a beast of a runner he'd run he'd run a marathon in like 240 i think once and when i did my first road marathon and i finished it in four and a half hours mm-hmm. and he you know we were with a group of people and he had made a you know, like, Hey, just want to point out that Josh finished his first marathon is great today. He said, I th- and he said, it's harder to run a marathon in four thirty than it is two forty. <laughs> and you know, could, could, uh, could one of the greats, could Courtney or, or Jim or Killian, could they, would, would they actually do UTMB if they were going to finish at 42 hours? I don't know. They're not built for that. Their minds aren't right. built for that. I'm not saying they couldn't, but I'm saying like, if they don't, if they're not going to get like 19 to 23, 24, 
they're probably not going to finish. Right. So you're, the joke is true, but I think there's also something right about, like you are right about that. Like it would be so much easier to get it done quicker. Get it done quicker. I don't think that trivializes. I think that's just a fantastic observation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as far as other races go after this, I don't want to put mm -hmm. the cart before the horse, but I think mm -hmm. when you finish this, mm -hmm. we need yes. to find you a race in Europe while you're there. Uh huh. Um, basically. Yeah. So I have an excuse to come out. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's one and, and the timing just isn't exactly right. But point being this would, I was going mm -hmm. to absolutely reach out to you about this. There's a race at the tip top of Norway. Okay. And, uh, like, I don't, I, I can't believe how big those Scandinavian countries are by land, but it's way up there. You tr Tromso. Uh huh. Am I, Tromso. How do you say it? Tromso. Tromso. Yeah. The it's O a, with a line through o, it. The O with a line through it goes, uh, like you're getting punched in the stomach. Tromso. Uh, <laughs> like books. It's like the, uh, so you book. fly into there and then you drive a little bit and, and it's a hundred, it's like a 110 mile run. Uh, then another one I'm looking at is the Trail de Dons du Midi. I haven't got the dates yet, but this it's very French. Where's that? Switzerland. It's just on the other side of like Chamonix area, roughly. That one's been on my radar for a long time. Um, but I, I want to do so right now. When someone, I love that you brought this up because I've been thinking about this. When someone thinks about races in Europe, they just think about UTMB. But when you talk to local, like legit ultra runners. That's mm -hmm. like them saying, oh, in America, it's just Western states. I'd be like, no, man, there's like, there's a 200, 100 milers that have less than 100 people at the starting line. It's the right. same thing over there. And it's, but it's older. So that's my, uh, my wife's family is going to, a bunch of us are going to Italy um, oh. in June. Cool. And a bunch of us are, my sister in law turned 50. She rented like a villa in Tuscany. So we're all going to stay mm. in this villa in Tuscany for a week. But Wonderful. before and after, various members of the family are staying places. Um, Kathy and I are going to be in Rome for a couple of days before. Cool. And then we have to come right home afterwards because my oldest graduates from high school two days oh, later. We don't want to miss that. So, um, But anyway, so Kathy's brother, Brian, who just finished Buffalo, is uh, looked at the calendar and found a race in the Dolomites. So he's doing a 100 Ooh. miler in the Dolomites right oh, before my gosh. spending a week in Tuscany. So. Oh, yeah, that's gonna that's there's plenty of races over there. Yeah, so I, wanna, I, I definitely want to find something. I need to look it up for you. There's a hundred miler. It's probably a hundred k actually that they do in the south of Norway. That's actually in the fjords, and you're literally running from sea level up two thousand feet, back down to sea level, up two thousand feet, back down to sea level. Wow. I don't know how many times. But it's just up these fjords and back down again. So, so you're running by the water and the next thing oh you're gosh. running up this hill and then you're back down the water. Anyway. Are there fjords all throughout Norway or is there like a central plate, like a like rough area where the fjords are? No, the whole coast of Norway. Okay. Is fjord. Fjordy. Yeah. Fjordy. <laughs> Fjordy to the max. So really quick, um, yeah. I kind of wanted to go over... You've done a lot of, I've listened to every interview, got Thanks. all of the insight here. I totally feel like I could run a hundred miler myself. I don't, I don't think that. You could. Um, well, uh, that's a different podcast. So what are some of the key <laughs> things that you've picked up from people? One, to get started, I know when you were talking yeah. about yeah. this sort of goes into what we were just talking about before we started talking about European races um, is about running your own race, yeah. checking in and yeah. making sure that you're still running Josh's race. You're not trying to run yeah. with, yeah. you know, mm. Jeremy yeah. or Alex, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. but you're still running your race. Do you have uh, any th plan in place mentally to kind of check in with yourself and to make sure you're, you're doing that. Yeah. I mean, okay. So step one is to be able to, to be able to have that ability and that's mm -hmm. nutrition based for me at this point. 
So I had just never understood how important this was until Jesse Rich said, 30% of all the calories you consume are eaten up by your brain. I love and that. So when I, had, I think my, I think my I mind no blew idea. the same way yours did when he started talking about yeah. how your, bo- your brain is telling your body to stop any way that it can yeah. because it's starving. And so then combine that with Alex's saying that when that high executive functioning part of your brain shuts down, the part of your brain that takes over is your, you know, ancient reptile brain that has right. no intention of running a hundred miles. So if, if I'm going to be able to do the mental check-ins, I've got to, I've got to consume calories correctly and carbs correctly. And I've never thought about it this way. So special thanks to Jesse and Alex for, for putting this on my radar and, and carbs was from Jesse, you know, saying 60 to 80 carb grams of carbs. I could be getting that wrong. The measurement grams Mm -hmm. per hour and 200 to 300 calories per hour. So if I were to do one thing that I think I've done wrong is I've tried to do a lot of it with food. And even though I've done like gels and stuff like that too, but even gels is like to, to get all those calories from dense things just starts to weigh me down in anybody probably. So I'm trying to get a lot of these carbs and calories from liquid uh, for as long as possible. So tailwind is, is the strategy. If right. I can get my, with some Seattle gummy. So if I have tailwind, one pack of Seattle gummy every like hour and a half and, and uh, you know, I've got it kind of dialed in the amount of tailwind I need to consume every hour. If I can okay. give myself that then I have the chance to then go through the other 28 episodes of this season (laughs) where I'm looking at how to keep going. Like if Elsa's, uh, you know, her insight on making it a party, making it count, making it matter for certain things. Like, right. If my brain's in a good place, I can do that. Uh, so I, you know, I think of that one, if I even just go through it like chronologically in my brain, like all the episodes, Candace Burtz was, was one that really stuck out of uh, just asking the question, am I okay right now? Like right now, is everything okay yes. right now? You know, it because was funny. I thought my about brain that goes episode. crazy. I thought about that episode when she talked about that checking in, like, how am I right now? When I was listening to yesterday, I listened to the episode with um, the therapist. Oh Yeah. Because he never used the words, but he basically was talking about radical acceptance where you have Hmm. to just accept, like when you you have to stop and think about that right now, you can't, you can't move forward until you know where you are. So that's That's another, another question I have for you, as far as the mental stuff goes, do you, do you do any sort of meditation or anything like Um, it? you know, not, nothing formal. Uh, sure. I would say things that fall into that category where I have similar outcomes, but nothing that's, you know, prescribed or regimented. Do you have right. any recommendation? I have some breathing exercises actually. I can t- uh, talk to you about mm. there are two books I've read recently that have my brain uh-huh. in a different uh, neighborhood. I finally read born to run. Mm. Um, congrats. Which I know everybody, it's it's funny. I read that and didn't immediately think, oh, I should go run 200 miles. Uh, I'm probably the first person to ever read born to run and not immediately think, oh, I should be. Well, I think it speaks to that, that book, the number of people that did is I think that that speaks to how that book hit like a population that was ready for it, wanted it. Absolutely. The number of, cause the number of people that responded to it by, oh, I'm going to go do that. Yes. I was listening to you talked to the author and I was on a run and I was actually running past a bookstore. <laughs> and I thought, are you serious? The hell? So I went inside. Yeah. So I went inside and That's bought funny. a copy and I read it, but it, he's such an amazing writer. And that yeah. book is so well researched and so well written that I, I ripped through it in like three days. I, I love that good? book so much. Yeah. But, but that one. And there's another book called breath uh, by James mm-hmm. Nestor, um, okay. which I picked up back when, I first started having uh, respiratory issues back in 2018. Mm. A friend of mine recommended it. And uh, the two books hit on this same idea 
And then Alex talked about it a lot in his too, where as human beings, at some point, evolution decided that our brain was our best chance, right? So evolution switched from our bodies being, uh, you know, what, what, how we survived was through our physical fitness to mm-hmm. suddenly our brains took over. Our, we're like, mm-hmm. well, if we develop our brain more, you know, we can, uh, we have a better chance at survival. Yeah. And then all of that happened. Our brain development all happened at the expense of everything else. Like hmm. we destroyed our bodies, especially our heads, hmm. like our, our breathing and stuff. As far as animals in the animal kingdom, the way we breathe doesn't make any sense as far as long-term survival, but our brains are so big that it pushed everything Whoa. forward to make room for the brain. And now we just have these like weird, like no other animal has this like weird forward facing down facing nose and um interesting anyway it's this whole thing this book breath is really interesting it talks about all the evolution there but then alex uh in his interview talked about how our brains uh want to get the most from the least so Mm. we now have this brain inside of us that's like well if there's if there's a problem instead of my body fixing it, I can use my brain to come up with a way to treat it. So, and this goes back to born to run where it's like, we develop Mm. these issues with our feet. And instead of going back to using our feet, the way they were intended, we designed more and more sophisticated footwear. So we're not fixing the problem. Our brain Mm. is like, well, this is a lot easier if I just like stop. Yeah. Wow. Wearing the right shoe, wearing different shoes is a lot easier than, um, so anyway, so my, that's, my head's been in this whole space where I'm like, how do we take the best of what our brain has to offer hmm. while getting back to treating our bodies the way they are meant to be treated? So we get this yeah. ultimate physical fitness just to bring this back to me. So I've been running a lot since we moved up here uh-huh. and it's been hard because my back is my lower back is killing me. And there's two reasons. One, my core is essentially, I think doctors say made of custard. My core is okay. Yeah. I've heard the clinical term. It's, it's maybe more like a flan where it bounces back a little bit, but it's very, very soft. Uh, and then my form is really bad when I run uphill, especially I lean forward hard. Mm, And so the only thing holding me from my face falling in the dirt is those lower back muscles. Oh, so my brain is like, take drugs, you know, just cram the ibuprofen, get maybe even Mm -hmm. get like a back brace or it's like, take a look at your shoes. What's the best shoe for keeping back pain away. But I know my, the way my body's designed, I just know that I need to work on the muscles that are supposed to be working together Mm. to strengthen the ones that aren't there. Like I don't need to do back lifts or squats or whatever. I need to strengthen up my core to keep that back from happening. Mm. Um, so anyway, all of this in a very roundabout way, uh, is just to say that I think when you're running, you need to find a way to, when your brain is getting into that weird, right. Cause your brain's telling you to stop your brain's like, I don't want to run. If, if this thing hurts running a hundred miles is what's causing it to hurt. So your brain's like, you know, it'd be easier not doing this. And that's what it's telling you. And I think there are some, uh, just some exercises you can do Hmm. to recenter. Yeah. Without getting too, uh, woo woo on you, but I can't, if you want to, I can fully go there. (laughs) But I have a, I have a inclination towards woo woo ism. I get it. I'm with you. I'll, 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 uh, maybe I'll get the audio book of this in my final week or two of training to listen to breath. James Nestor. It's a, it's a really good book. Really interesting about that, but it's, um, I think that'll, it would help for you to find a way to, to find an exercise that's quick and easy where you can just re center, like reset your brain. And then the other issue of course, is knowing when you need to do that. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a good point. But we'll develop uh, hand signals and things. Yeah. Coming to aid stations. We don't have to talk about it. I can, I would love that. (laughs) 
Am I stealing second? Um, well, I, I can't tell you how, uh, like I'm, I'm overhyped and I know that you're, you're driving from Seattle to the Mm -hmm. virgin desert. I am. Uh, okay. Maybe as a final thing here, can you tell us, cause it's funny. Um, Laverkin. Laverkin. Oh boy. (laughs) You always, until we've been there, you always explain to me why it's called that. So Laverkin is a city in Utah and it's, it's a part of, uh, if you're going to Zion, you will go through Laverkin. Tell us about Laverkin. You will pass over a bridge. And when you pass over a bridge, there's a big sign that says Laverkin. And there used to be under that sign, there was a little thing that said it, it was like a native word for beautiful Valley or beautiful place or something like that. Apparently at some point, somebody who actually knew that language wised up and was like, this ain't the case. So when the Mormon settlers went South um, and kind of established areas in uh, St. George, some of them went over there to Laverkin and there were already people living there (laughs) because Utah at the time was a Mexican territory. So there were Spanish speaking people who lived in this valley and um, there is a river that runs through there, runs through Zion. It's the beautiful Virgin River. Um, if you've ever driven to Las Vegas, you drive through the Virgin River Gorge down through Arizona. Okay. The Spanish word for virgin, and I don't, I'm not a Spanish speaker, so if I murder it, it's essentially La Virgin. Mm-hmm. And the settlers, the English speaking <laughs> settlers, couldn't grasp it. So La Virgin. It's hard is basically white (laughs) talk trying to say La Vergin. So the town is called Laverkin, named after Laverkin (laughs) River. Sorry. Well, my family's from Malad, Idaho, which was named after the poisonous river. So, (laughs) (laughs) Well, there we go. We've done a great job of naming things around here. We have. We've given people a lot of uh, really great geography. Um, Well, I'll see you. I'm also super excited about this race. I can't uh, wait. I just want to be out in the desert. Yeah. I just can't wait. I got it. I can't wait to see you there. Uh, All right. This has been the this has been the DFL before DNF podcast from Borderlands. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, come back anytime. It's been a real treat. <laughs>